<laughs> Hello and welcome to this month's Climate Crisis Advisory Group public broadcast and thank you for joining us in what is an increasingly urgent dialogue about the state of our planet. Today we're going to be focusing on our oceans. They're a cornerstone of Earth's life support system but recent data reveals that we've reached a new high in average daily sea surface temperatures, 20.96 degrees Celsius. This milestone isn't just alarming, it's unprecedented in the historical record. Now, normally ocean temperatures peak in March. The fact that we're seeing this surge in August is a sign that climate scientists across the globe find deeply concerning. Now, why should we care? It's a good question. Our oceans are not simply huge pools of water. They help to regulate and control the Earth's climate. So rising temperatures interfere with the ocean's ability to absorb heat and carbon dioxide emissions. This interference with the vital work of the oceans destabilizes weather patterns and accelerates sea level rise. The truth is, we cannot separate the well-being of our oceans from the well-being of our planet and the well-being of all humanity. So today, we aim to delve into the state of our oceans, examining the ramifications of these record-breaking temperatures and exploring possible solutions to mitigate damage and restore their vital role of regulating our climate. The alarm bells are ringing and it's time for action. Okay, as always, I'd like to welcome our CCAG scientists and introduce our guests. Today, we're joined by Brad Ack, CEO of Ocean Visions, Marty Odlin, CEO and founder of Running Tide, Yolanda Waters, marine social scientist from the University of Queensland, and Divya Nawale, Climate Force Ambassador for Antarctica. Um, thank you all so much for being here today for this really, really important discussion. Now, I'm going to start off by asking our first guest, Brad Ack, to provide just a bit more context about the state of our oceans and why this is raising so much alarm. So, Brad, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for um, that introduction. And Pleasure to be here with you. Um, let me just share a few images to help with um, my presentation here. So I'm going to assume that you can all see the screen. As said, I am the CEO of an organization called Ocean Visions, and our tagline is Advancing Solutions for Ocean Climate Restoration. And as an ocean organization, you might wonder why we have climate in our tagline. And it's because of the inseparable link between the health of the ocean and the health of our climate, as Adi was just saying. And we're all about solutions, uh, not simply documenting and describing the problem as we have grown extremely good at in the conservation and science community, but actually trying to figure out what are the pathways forward to doing something about these very challenging problems. So just quickly, Ocean Visions is a very small organization, but it sits at the center of a robust uh, group of partners uh, that you can see on the screen, mostly uh, focused or, or based in North America, but uh, we are expanding um, slowly to a much more international audience. And we try to catalyze action amongst this broad group of organizations around the co-design development, testing and evaluation of a whole range of solutions to this ocean climate crisis. Um, I'm gonna just quickly skip through this. These are just some of the ways that we work. Um, I think most importantly is that we're focused on what we would call underinvested issues in the ocean space. And there is no underinvested issue more than the climate crisis. And you know, this slide simply tries to illustrate that these are the same thing. It's really impossible to talk about the climate crisis without being 
talking about the ocean at the same time. The ocean is at 70% of the planet, regulates much of the climate and its components comprise much of the earth system of which the climate uh, is part as well. And the biggest problem for the ocean, bar none, is the spiking amount of greenhouse gases that we have in the atmosphere. I, you all know this extremely well. Uh, just over the last thousand years, you know, you can see that it's been steady and stable uh, for quite a long time until the Industrial Revolution, in which time we've seen this enormous spike of CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide. But more importantly is to put this in the longer historical record. You know, over the last 800,000 years, carbon cycle fluctuations have never really gone outside of around 80 parts per million uh, in and out of uh, glacial periods. And then at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution over here in the far right uh, corner of the graph, you see this almost straight line. And that is where we are today. And the point of this is that we are wildly outside of historic bounds. Uh, you mentioned in the introduction that we're right now outside of normal bounds with ocean heat, but that's part of a bigger problem, which is that we are wildly outside historic bounds of carbon in the atmosphere. And so to think that we can solve this problem or make things better while we maintain these enormously elevated levels is probably uh, a dangerous assumption at best. You might think about this as if um, your body had ingested a massive amount of toxins all at the same time, it would take time for that to stabilize to some new normal. And we are not there yet. If we stopped emitting tomorrow, stabilizing to uh, an earth at 420 parts per million would see a lot more changes. And a lot of those would be in the ocean. So really we need to figure out how to come back from these numbers. The, the um, buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere causes two enormous stresses to our ocean. The first is thermal. And this was also referenced in the introduction. This graphic just shows the anomalies in sea surface temperature uh, in the last decade compared to the 1950 to 1980. Um, and of course, if this was updated for 2023, there would be a lot more bright red. But this thermal stress is a result of the ocean absorbing most of the heat that we've trapped on the planet as a result of this blanket of greenhouse gases. We blithely sort of throw around these numbers. 93% of all the excess heat trapped on the planet has gone into the ocean hence all of the warming, that is a staggering actual figure that has been calculated by a group of researchers to be around the equivalent of seven atomic bombs, similar to the ones that were detonated in World War II, seven of those going into the ocean every second, every second of every minute, of every hour, of every day, of every month, of every year. That's how much heat we are pouring into the ocean. And that curve has been uh, accelerating. So it was around five 20 years ago, and now it's at seven. And again, that heat will not turn off until atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begin to come down, full stop. Nothing else turns off that heat. There are some things that might slow it down, and we'll talk about those. But what is this doing to the ocean? First, it's a big contributor to sea level rise because warmer water expands. Big contributor to the decrease in dissolved oxygen levels across the ocean because warmer water holds less dissolved oxygen. Marine heat waves, which we've all experienced this summer, unlike anything we've seen before. And of course, one of the most obvious victims of that is coral reefs, which are um, in extreme jeopardy in this warming ocean. But these heat waves and marine heat also interrupts, interrupts mixing between the upper layer and the mid layer of the ocean where all the nutrient exchange takes place for much of the ocean's food web. It's creating more powerful storms. We're just experiencing this right now on the east coast of the Atlantic, uh, excuse me, on the east coast of North America. Um, it's increasing the melt of sea ice and ice sheets, which have obviously uh, positive uh, feedback loops or climate feedback loops that are also dangerous. 
and we're seeing a poleward migration of marine animals. So this is bar none the biggest threat to ocean health. It's not fishing, it's not plastics, it's not habitat uh, de degradation uh, or destruction. All of those things are important, but nothing holds a candle to the amount of heat that we're pouring into the ocean on a regular basis, thermal stress. The second big stress to the ocean coming from this buildup of greenhouse gases, in this case, especially carbon dioxide, is chemical stress. The ocean has absorbed a very significant portion of all of our CO2 emissions, anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And of course, that's helping prevent worse things from happening on land, but it's a very big impact to the ocean. 30% increase in ocean acidity in the upper layer of the ocean in the last 180 years. So a giant impact to 70% of the planet which impacts any aquatic life that forms calcium carbonate shells, which is a very significant portion of the lower part of the food chain. And essentially, we are performing a giant uncontrolled experiment on the ocean by continuing to dump CO2 into the upper layer of the ocean. There is a tremendous storehouse of, of carbon uh, in the form of bicarbonate and carbonates at the bottom of the sea, uh, that is part of the ocean's carbon cycle. And those are far more, uh, quote unquote, safe for the ocean than this dissolved carbon dioxide gas in the upper layer of the ocean. So thermal stress and chemical stress, the two biggest threats to the ocean, not going to turn off until we reduce atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. So just remember that. And then you have to say, well, how's our current agenda working to do that? And you well know that it's not working well at all. Um, we have seen a steady upward rise in carbon dioxide emissions year on year on year with a slight interruption during COVID, but immediate rebounding in 2021 and 2022, which both saw record CO2 emissions. And fossil fuels still account for about 80 2% of all of our primary energy use on the planet. So while we are making progress on green energy, we are not making progress anywhere near fast enough. And in fact, we see that the world's largest banks continue to invest incredible amounts of money in fossil fuels. And there was just a report, two reports last week about explicit and implicit subsidies for fossil fuels. And those are from the G20 and those are also maintaining extremely high and record levels. So re the, the pathway of looking solely at reducing emissions is clearly not delivering in time for our ocean or in time for our planet. So this is my last slide. We work on an agenda similar, I think, to the uh, Climate Crisis Advisory Group. We call it the four R's. They're not exactly the same as yours. The first is reduce. Yes, we have to transition to a low carbon and zero carbon economy. And the ocean has a number of different ways it can contribute to that transition. Secondly, we have to remove massive quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere and the upper level of the ocean. Around a thousand gigatons or a trillion tons of carbon need to come back out of the system, reverse uh, emissions over the next 80 years, over the next 70 years, and as quickly as possible. And Marty is uh, championing one pathway to do that that you'll hear more about in a minute. We also are going to need to stabilize critical parts of the Earth system in the meantime, because clearly we are running the risk of collapse of critical parts of the Earth system and the, the slow process of cooling the planet via reducing and removing we can't put all our chips on those two cards or on those two numbers uh, and hope that they will cool the planet in time to avoid dangerous losses in the Arctic, Antarctica, and other parts of the system. So there's going to need to be interventions to repair. And the fourth part of our approach is to build a much broader global community of makers and solvers, diverse geographically, diverse culturally, diverse disciplinarily, uh, to put much more effort and attention into solving these problems. So with that, I will stop and turn it back to you. Thank you.
Thank you very much indeed, um, Brad. That was, um, wow. Wow, it was, uh, I, I feel like I need uh, a, a few seconds just to absorb all of that really heavy information. I mean, the top line for me is, you know, where you say the biggest stress um, to ocean health um, is the amount of heat that's being absorbed by our oceans, which you're saying is the equivalent to seven atomic bombs every second of every minute of every day, every year. I mean, that is just, if that doesn't sink home at the state of our planet and the, the situation that we're in, I, I, I don't think anything will. So once again, um, Brad, thank you so much for that. Um, look, you mentioned, the, you also mentioned the chemical and thermal stress and the enormous risks uh, that these create. And one, one byproduct of this amongst us um, as humans is a rising sense of emotional stress as we feel the urgent need for action. Now, even as the world banks continue to invest trillions of dollars in fossil fuels and global, car uh, global carbon emissions continue to increase, it's, it's just so worrying that there is like this disconnect between what our world leaders are doing and what our planet needs. Now, Brad, given that neither decarbonization nor mass carbon removal are likely to achieve a cooling of the planet in time to avoid catastrophic changes in our ocean, what other climate in interventions might be possible in a shorter time frame that would buy us time um, for the other interventions to work? How can we give ourselves more time, Brad? Well, that is the question we're all struggling with. You know, first, I just want to respond to your point about climate grief. Um, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, there's no way to avoid that fact. But we also have to move past the grief and into a place of action because action is what helps dispel the grief. Feeling helpless will not do anybody any good. And so we're joined, you know, by people who are working diligently on many parts of this, uh, of this puzzle, of this challenge, the greatest challenge really that humanity's ever faced. And we have to recognize that there are pathways forward. We also have to recognize it's an emergency situation. And like we did in COVID, we can change things very quickly, right? If I would have told you three and a half years ago that your kids were going to have to stay home from school for the next 12 months, you would have said that's never going to happen. Or that we were going to um, focus almost all of the world's attention on chasing a vaccine. You would have said, no, that's, that's not going to happen. We're not going to do it. We can't focus like that. But we did. So we can. We know that we can. But we have to accept the gravity of the situation first. So I, that's why I go to the dark place of this information, because you have to accept the gravity if you're going to have a commensurate response. Now to your question, we're going to have to come up with other interventions that cool the planet in the short term in order to maintain livability and function while we take the harder, while we change our lifestyle, so to speak, and take the harder steps over the longer term. You know, it's kind of like emergency medicine. If you have a lot of, a lot of problems, you know, you might need to start eating healthy and exercising regularly, and it's going to take some time for those things to work. But in the meantime, you might need some sort of emergency intervention to maintain your health. Um, the, we're in that sort of a situation. Some of those things, uh, obviously, the most extreme are going to be solar radiation modification. Um, but there are variations on that that are much less extreme, like marine cloud brightening. Let's just say we put devices on the back of every ship on the planet to create low-lying marine clouds and reflect heat like they're experimenting with at the Great Barrier Reef right now in order to cool uh, the reef during times of bleaching. What if we did that across the globe? Could we, change, could we change the amount of heat being reflected back into the atmosphere? What if we painted every surface bright, brilliant white, as has been proposed, by no less than a former Secretary of Energy uh, in this country and others. It's not absurd at all. There are things that can be done, but it takes that emergency attitude footing to begin to do them on the scale that's going to be necessary in order to make a change, an impact. Yeah, thank you, uh, Brad, for that. I, 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 you know, the, the whole um, point where you talked about 
not being fearful, um, I think is so important. You know, I, I tend to use my um, experience from playing um, sport, elite level sport in this situation. And, you know, I always use fear as a way to focus, to focus my mind. You know, we can't be fearful. We have to be focused. Um, look, I, I think it's really important what we're talking about today. And if you're just joining us for the first time, please spread the word. I know there's a lot of people out there who are worried, who are feel overwhelmed by what's happening with the climate crisis. But as Brad has mentioned there, he's gone to the dark places, but there are solutions. There is hope and there is a community that is out there that can, that can help drive us forward and take us out of this situation. Um, I think this is going to be a great um, point for me now to, to move on to uh, our, our, our panel of scientists. And um, I, I want to go to you first, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, and, and ask you this question. So many people are, are, are grappling with climate anxiety, and some would say this is a completely rational response to what is happening. Can this emotional response be channeled into meaningful action for ocean con conservation? Yeah, thanks, Ade. I mean, I think that's right. I think while climate anxiety is a specific sort of term that um, is being measured in the same way as kind of generalised anxiety, and so people that have the, those kind of um, symptoms of climate anxiety will have their quality of life significantly disrupted. They'll find it difficult to sleep. Um, uh, they'll be distracted in the day um, and so on. So we don't find that that's a very widespread ph phenomenon, but a lot of people are saying that they're very worried about climate change, definitely. And certain populations are uh, feeling the, the, that anxiety more than others, people that have men existing mental health problems, younger people as well. So certain groups are, are, are certainly more worried than others. And as you say, it, it's not an irrational response at all to worry about the, this level of existential threat that we're facing. Um, as has already been mentioned, actually, one of the best ways to um, deal with anxiety is to channel that into productive action, to actually take action and feel like uh, you're making a difference. Um, so, so try to overcome any feeling of, of helplessness. And that can actually be best done with other people. So as a collective, so join a group of like minded people people that you can share your concerns with. Um, and as a collective, you'll probably find that, that action is more effective as well. So, so that would be the sort of the take home. But, but in terms of kind of the link between climate anxiety and ocean conservation, I, I think that might not be something that naturally comes to mind for people. We know that people that have uh, climate anxiety are already taking more action on climate change, but they tend to associate it more with things like reducing uh, waste, thinking about the sort of maybe energy consumption. So things that are um, maybe more sort of well-established uh, actions that the individual can take to reduce their environmental footprint. There may not necessarily be good awareness about what they can do to address ocean issues specifically. So I think there would need to be kind of links that that, that would need to be made for people to encourage them to make those links. And um, for some communities, coastal communities, for example, that might be a, a more obvious link than others. And there might be different ways in um, for different communities. Mm. I think it's definitely something that we in the UK have to take into mind because we're, we're an island. You know, we're surrounded by seas. Um, so our connection with the oceans and the seas is, is it, it's inseparable. Um, so it's really important. But you now, once again, um, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, thank you for that. Um, I'm now going to move on to uh, Professor Nerali Abram. Um, and if I could turn to you, you here and ask you, what impacts on marine biodiversity are you seeing from your own research and field of work, such as your recent expedition to Antarctica? Thanks, Ade. Um, so I'll just start by pointing out that I, I'm not a marine um, biologist, um, but certainly I I mean, one of the things that we saw just reported in the news last week was the, the terrible story about um, emperor penguin colonies where um, entire col colonies have had breeding failure, um, had chicks drowning because the sea ice broke up before they'd gotten their waterproof um, w um, feathers. And I think one of the, the issues that we have with these kind of devastating impacts of climate change is that they're often quite invisible. So there's not usually people sort of 
in Antarctica at those um, colonies to actually be able to see an event like this. And this was something that was monitored um, by being able to, to see those colonies um, using satellites and seeing that the, the sea ice disappeared on those colonies before the chicks had had a chance to, um, to establish. Uh, one of the other places that I work um, is coral reefs. Um, and in particular, looking at how we can use corals to get um, a history of, of the oceans. But one of the things that we face there is that reefs now are, are bleaching frequently. Uh, and so these records that we use scientifically, we go and collect these cores that give us hundreds of years of climate information. And we're seeing now that the, the records that we depend upon are actually being destroyed by the very process that we're trying to, to study. Um, so again, it's one of these things that is often sort of invisible um, in, when, we're, when we're talking about climate change and when we're talking about the ways that people um, can actually engage with climate change. I think maybe penguin chicks has something that will have um, had engagement with um, many people. Um, often sort of the, the reef is something where when we, we have these images of what a reef looks like, but even those things so far haven't been enough to actually turn around the trajectory that we're on and actually have that meaningful um, action to start reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I think um, those are very powerful and they're part of the conversation, um, but they're also not enough um, when we are talking about how we're going to actually get action to tackle this problem. Yeah, I, I, I fear um, narrowly that it's going to have to impact us personally as, as, as human beings and, and also economically before um, action moves on. But I, I hope, um, you know, what we're doing here can, can play a part in, um, in, 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 in pricking people's mindsets, especially our leaders. As well, I, just another point on on biodiversity. Another story, uh, and the reason why I've been looking down is um, I just needed to remind myself of my notes. So I, I, a few years ago, I made a documentary um, about how at uh, the front line of climate change, and one of the stories we 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 did on which uh, we we talked about, which was just mind boggling, was the fact that um, in the northern Great Barrier Reef, um, over the last ten to twenty years. 99% of green turtles that were being hatched were being born um, as female. And that was because of ocean temperature rises and sand rises. The, the rise in sand temperature and ocean temperatures um, has been proven to affect the sex of, of, the, um, of, of the sea turtles, um, which is catastrophic for them. It's basically extinction um, events if they're only being born as females. So, you know, there is so much, there's so much impact um, left, right and center on how it's impacting us. Um, I'm gonna move on to uh, Divya. Uh, and um, yeah, Divya, I, uh, first of all, welcome to uh, the, the CCAG group. Um, could you give us your thoughts on today's uh, topic as well as giving us your question as well? Thank you. Thank you, Ade. Um, it's exciting to be here and part of this um, group. I'm not a scientist um, and I'm always excited to learn from scientists. And I think um, for uh, someone who was uh, a youth activist before and now working as a professional, um, I, I have um, experienced um, going from a lot of climate anxiety and climate grief myself um, to really feeling maybe not 100%, but a little bit more empowered. Um, I have always, um, you know, experienced that when you are trying to work towards solutions and being able to work in the capacity, in whatever capacity that you are, uh, with the guidance of, um, you know, scientists and be able to actually learn from them on how we can actually um, really approach the climate problem and especially with regards to oceans which we don't really know a lot about i think um the word that again uh, i already said is empowerment i think how we empower ourselves with the knowledge provided um by groups like the ccag and also by being able to engage in such conversations 
um, is how we can together um, really work on some of the climate anxiety that we all have, um, and especially young people have. And I think um, this conversation today is really important because um, ocean consists most of our tipping points of the planet, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, um, and most other kind of uh, weather patterns that happen um, are because of the oceans. So I think because our key tipping points are based on how the oceans um, uh, behave and um, essentially the weather patterns caused by the oceans are really important for the future of what we will see, uh, whether it's a two degree C future, three degree C or four degree C future. I think it all depends on the ocean and um, I'm really grateful to have this uh, opportunity to uh, contribute. Thank you, um, Divya. And your question for our panel. Yeah, um, so I know uh, Nerly also mentioned about uh, the Antarctic, and um, I think I wanted to focus a little bit about understanding especially what's happening in our polar regions, because um, those really are the places where a lot of the water is heating very quickly. Um, and specifically, I've seen that the Antarctic Treaty System has been interestingly a good example um, or a relatively good example uh, for the last 60 years where we have been able to um, set up a number of conventions like the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. Um, there is, of course, the marine protected areas that have been set up making Ross Sea the biggest uh, MPA in the world. And I think it has served um, as, as a really good um, framework that can be replicated uh, for other parts of the world. As of today, I believe only 7% of the world's oceans are protected in the form of marine protected areas. Um, so I'm wondering how can we replicate something like a, a treaty system, like the Antarctic Treaty System, to go beyond and look at regions which are really like tipping points and how we can protect them uh, better. Great question, Divya. Um, you know, basically, how can we replicate the, um, the treaty system that's protecting the Antarctic for the rest of our oceans? I mean, frankly, I, I think it's bizarre that we haven't got something that's protecting all our oceans. Um, I'm going to go to, to Sir Dave for this one first. It feels like a political question, um, and uh, I think you, you, you might be suitable to tackle this one, Dave. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. I, I think, obviously, yes, of course, we should have a treaty that covers the, the oceans. At the moment, we know that the oceans around island states uh, essentially the decisions on how they're used are with those island states. Um, and this is not always a good thing. I just have to point out that many ships, for example, will, uh, will emit really nasty stuff into the atmosphere if they're not guided through local regulations in ocean waters. But in the international waters, we're in a very different place. We've got a London protocol set up by the United Nations. Not all nations have signed up to it. And the London Protocol is really looking at the commercial shipping operations. And it, it does talk about dumping at sea and so on. But there's, there's no clear way forward of the kind that you've just described. Um, extremely difficult. If we're saying it's very difficult to stop the fossil fuel industry from continuing their operations and in particular subsidizing them extremely heavily around the world, if we can't stop that, how do we stop the businesses that use the oceans uh, as a, a means of their getting around, uh, transporting goods and so on? So I, I think the, the vested interests is always what we will come up against. But we do need to understand oceans are an open book in terms of regulatory procedure. We really need to understand that. And this has to be tackled. It's a really important um, situation and issue here, how we deal with our oceans. Um, now, I, I, I'm cognizant that we're almost um, we're over half an hour into um, this, uh, this uh, live stream, and I haven't gone to Professor Mark Maslin, and I'm sure he's probably champing at the bit to take this one on. So over to you, Mark. Well, I, I had to say I agree with Dave. The biggest issue we have is, of course, a lack of international collaboration. 
again, the rules are that uh, any country has sovereignty over the oceans up to 200 miles away from the coastline. But then you get into international waters. And as Dave said, actually, that's where it becomes very murky. Who actually has rights? Who actually has control over that? And it's a huge area. I mean, if you think about it, the oceans cover 70% of the surface of the earth. And therefore, international waters cover a huge area. So I think that moving forward, we need something like the Antarctic Treaty to cover international waters. Because we know that there's a huge amount of fishing that goes on in those international waters. There's a huge amount of exploration for fossil fuels. And one of the biggest worries, which is already being discussed in the UK Parliament, is then the mining of sediments on the surface of the deep ocean for rare metals, which will only cause mass disruption and, of course, destruction of uh, valuable ecosystems in the oceans. Mm. Mark, uh, and um, any one of you on the, on the panel is open to this, but here's a thought. This is part of the reason why we, as everyday people, the public, feel powerless and feel that sense of hopelessness. You know, the fact that, you know, there's so much vested interest, uh, there's uh, so many, so much bureaucracy uh, um, that we have to get through in order to get our leaders to, to really care about our planet. The oceans, it seems like a no brainer. We have to take care of them. You know, we've listened to what um, Brad said at the top of, of, the, of the stream and, and how important they are. How, how do we, how can we be empowered? You know, what can we do as everyday people to, to change the minds of our politicians and our corporations and to make them work for us, especially when it comes to our oceans? I, who would like to take that one on? Mark. So again, I think that we as individuals have to actually realize that we're quite powerful. So the first thing I always say to everybody is talk about it. Don't bottle up that climate anxiety. Don't actually worry about it on your own. Talk about it. Actually engage with people. You'll find that your family, your kids and everybody else is just as worried as you. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing is do all the little things you can do that improve your life but also very positive for the environment. For example, moving to a more plant-based diet, huge impact on the climate uh, because of the carbon footprint, but also it's gonna make you a lot healthier and make sure your kids basically live to at least 100. And then you start thinking of all those little things. The other thing is remember, we have real power. We are lucky enough, many of us, to be in democratic countries so we can vote for parties that actually care about us and the environment. We can go on protests. We're lucky enough to have that freedom um, so we can actually protest and actually state what our aims are. And I think the third thing that people forget is you have real power in your wallet. You have to consume. Now, we want to reduce our consumption, but hey, look, we all have to eat. We all have to dress. We all have to go to work. But then you can make choices. You can make choices about what sustainable sort of like items you buy. What sort of things do you do? Do you have renewable energy? And again, those little choices, if we all do it, that shifts the whole economy. And we're seeing that in the renewable explosion around the world. So individually, we feel that we're not powerful. But oh, together, we can be incredibly powerful. But only if we talk to each other and actually make things happen. Great. Great, great answer. Yeah, let's talk to each other. Let's find our communities. And, and, and we have to do something. As we've been talking about, time is ticking. Time is, is running out. Um, thank you to our panel uh, for those answers. And especially thank you to Divya for um, your real uh, insightful thoughts and also a great question. Now, we've, we've kind of moved on towards solutions, you know, and uh, talking about solutions, I'd like to look into them a little further. So, I'm going to give the floor to Marty Odlin. Um, Marty, over to you. Hey. Okay. Um, well, look, you know, I, I really appreciate, I'm kind of w I'm watching the uh, 
watching the public comments on the side, listening. To I am as well. I am as well. They're pretty hardcore, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, like I think that there's. Um, I, I think something that doesn't get said enough about climate and about how we help the oceans here is, um, I, you know, what we have, what the climate crisis boils down to is a mass balance problem. We have too much carbon that has been emitted into the, into the fast cycle, into the atmosphere, into the upper layers of the ocean. And we have to move it out of it. It's just physics. It's not, you know, it, it's beyond politics. It's beyond anything else, right? It's beyond morality. It's just physics. We have to move the mass. And that means work. We have to move the mass. <laughs> and like, um, you know, there's a bunch of different mechanisms that we can do that with. There's a bunch of solutions by which we can move that mass. We can move alkaline materials from land, grind them up, put them in the ocean. We can line rivers. We can uh, grow biomass in the ocean where it'll absorb carbon at the surface of the ocean and then sink to the deep ocean, moving the carbon from the fast cycle to the slow cycle. Um, but at the end of the day, we have to go move the mass and it's just work. And when all these people, you know, everyone's so anxious. Um, and I agree, I feel a tremendous amount of anxiety, but the, the job is to move the mass. So if you feel anxious, figure out how to help move the mass. Now that can be on, you know, unsticking policy levers that can be stimulating market demand by calling companies and making sure that they pay for full carbon removal. But you have to move the mass and there's nothing else that gets in the way of that. And even if we hit net zero today, like suddenly magic, no more, no more fossil fuels, which we have to do, like we should do that, but we still have to move the mass. There's still a tremendous amount of material in the fast cycle that's causing however many Hiroshima bombs per second um, we're, we're, uh, that are absorbing in, of heat energy into the ocean. We have to move the mass. So um, sorry to like focus on that effort, but I think that sometimes it gets missed that there's, you know, certain treaties would do things, certain, certain, you know, you know, there, there's market things we can do. We can change behavior, et cetera. But if we do not move the mass, we do not fix the problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I think we need to do all of the above. We need to do all of the solutions. But I, I, I you know, if I could advocate for one thing, it's move the mass. And, you know, talking now to most mostly people in the UK or in Europe, um, you know, think of if we have to move all this mass around, there's all these alkaline materials to buffer out the acidity in the ocean. As, as one example, um, what we need is a Dunkirk. What we need is to focus our energy at a moment of crisis, you know, and uh, think of the inspirational story of Dunkirk where, you know, there's this, you know, dire situation and everyone collectively came together to go, you know, rescue those, um, rescue those people on the shore on the other side of the channel. That's what we need to do. We need to marshal all of our resources to go move the mass. And we have to do it with extreme sensitivity to the ecosystems that we interact with. We have to do it uh, collectively and, you know, to, to make sure that it's like an equitable distribution of resources as we're paying people to do this work. But at the end of the day, we have to go move the mass. And if we're not going to move the mass, we're not going to solve the problem. So, uh, sorry, right. not exactly what I plan on talking about, but I'm just looking at the, at, at the anxiety people have on the side. And, and, you know, if I could focus people's energy on one thing, if I could wave a magic wand, it'd be like, just go move the mass. Yeah. No, I and if you can't move the mass, figure out how to help people move the mass. No, I, 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 I totally agree with you and I, I get it um, Marty it's about trying to simplify things because at the moment part of the anxiety comes from how complex this all feels but when you put it in that way in those terms let's just move the mass let's get the chemicals out of our atmosphere let's let, let, let's let's uh, get the heat out of the oceans let's simplify things then you know I, I think it kind of makes it easier and it feels like the task we have isn't so big um, so no, I, I, I totally get that. And, uh, and, and I feel what you're talking about there. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Marty Odlin, uh, CEO and founder of running tide. Um, can I, I, I'm going to throw a quick question, I think, which is related to this, um, to what Marty has been talking about to, um, to Dave and, uh, so Dave, how can the private sector contribute to ocean health and help governments meet or exceed uh, the required goals. 
I mean, it's, it's an important question. I've always stressed the fact that without government regulation, the private sector is not going to make the significant contribution that we all know is needed. So it is required, I think, to create a level playing field for the private sector by setting good regulations in place. Um, what I would like to raise, and you may say uh, uh, that I'm ducking your question, Ade, but what I would like to raise is a particular mode of operation in the oceans, uh, which uh, we could have had from Marty, but my, this is creating green material in the surface of the oceans, which Marty did refer to. But what, what w a group of us are engaged in doing around the world right now is examining whether or not we can imitate the function of the, of the baleen whales, these very large whales that have been uh, culled over the last 400 years. That was the first oil discovery. The blue whales were culled for their uh, blubber and not for their meat. Uh, and this was a massive industry, and now the blue whales are down to roughly 1% of the population they were at 400 years ago. Can we intervene in some way to recover the blue whale population, and what are the consequences of that? Not just the blue whale, all the, blue, all the baleen whales. And I, I believe that is going to be possible, and that's what we're trying to investigate. The function of these whales in the biological systems of the ocean was critical. When a whale is eating 300 to 500 meters below sea level, the pressure of the water above them means that their orifices are all jammed shut. So when they come up, they come up for air, fill their lungs with fresh air, but they also come up to relieve themselves. And the feces that they produce is then produced in the sunlit surface of the ocean waters. 300 meters down, there's no sun shining. And the net result of that is a very quick growth of green matter in the surface of the ocean. This is like a farmer fertilizing the surface of the of farmland. And so what we see within a month or two, if a big green area has been formed by a big pot of whales, you might get something like a quarter of a million to half a billion fish in that area. And the fish have all arisen because the fish larvae that hatch from eggs need phytoplankton, which is this green matter that's formed on the surface of the ocean as a result of the fertilizer. Now, is it possible that we could put that artificial whale feces on the surface of the ocean and so create enough green material that we return the ocean population of the baleen whales, but also of all of the other biological material in the ocean, living matter in the ocean, including, of course, the fish that, uh, that many people have been overfishing, uh, but we could repopulate the fish population as well. But in the same breath as returning the biodiversity of the oceans, this process would also be taking up a very large amount of carbon dioxide. We could be taking up perhaps 10 billion tons of greenhouse gases a year of carbon dioxide a year by this process. This is a perhaps, we don't know yet, and we have to try it and see. But what, what I'm saying is here is an opportunity and many businesses are contacting us and saying, can we invest? And my answer is no, at this point in time, we're doing experiments. But why would they invest? Increasing fish populations has a return. Increasing carbon uptake has a financial return as well. So there is a business interest in this process. And frankly, re relieving business people of their funds in order to create more money is a good way to proceed. Uh, thank you very much for that, Sir David. It is frustrating, though, that um, in order to get um, the, the help that we need to, 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 to get us out of this climate crisis, um, we, we have to convince people that there's an economic um, upside or convince corporations that they can make money out of this. You know, we're, we're basically saying your house is on fire, um, but the only way you, you can save yourself is um, if you spend some money 
on on putting the fire out and and that's the only way that's going to convince these people and it feels quite illogical and also frustrating but i'd also take from that um you know we've talked about this before sir david about trying to replicate some of the things that our planet already does and using this as the solution or, or some of the solutions to get us out of the climate crisis and i've always said this uh, our planet this earth is our greatest bit of tech. So we need to use it. Um, but sadly, we're not gonna be able to use a lot of, or replicate a lot of that tech without the finance of the private sector. So we've got to get them involved somehow. Adding, Adding, let me just quick come back with an answer to a question. Somebody's saying, what about the krill that is needed for the whales to eat? Krill populations were, are massively increased by this population. The whales were in a circular process. They were feeding the formation of the krill by this process. Sorry, that was an interruption. Let's quickly move on. Yeah, no, no, that was great. That's great. It's once again, you know, reiterating that the earth is the greatest bit of tech that we have in terms of what it does. But OK, let's um, move on. Uh, time is short. So I'd like to bring in the perspective of Yolanda Waters. Now, Yolanda, thanks so much for joining us today. Can you give us your thoughts on what we've discussed so far? And can you also put your question to our members? Sure can. Well, thanks very much for having me and for everyone for the discussion so far. Um, so I'm a marine social scientist. So I study people and the way that people connect and feel and act towards the ocean. And what I'm really concerned about is this gap between attitudes and action. And what I really wanted to bring up, I guess, was what Professor Abram I brought up before in that none of this is new. Um, this happened before and nothing happened as a result. Like it's what we've been talking about in the discussion, it's all well and good to talk about or how dire the threats are and how innovative solutions can be. Um, but for example, so I'm in Australia, my work is on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Great Barrier Reef, it's a national, international icon. It's an icon for climate impact. It's an icon for ocean health. What's happening on the reef is a really good indicator of what's happening now and what's to come. Um, but for us here in Australia, these marine heat waves, these huge threats to the ocean are not new. In the past six years, we've had four mass bleaching events each time. There's lots of media, um, how, how catastrophic things are. And each time nothing happens as a result. Um, recently, um, UNESCO tried to put the Great Barrier Reef on the World Heritage in danger list to really demonstrate how bad things are. And there was a lot of pushback from government, from industry. And there's still this huge gap between attitudes and actions when it comes to public as well. They really, they understand the reefs under threat, but they're not really linking it to things that need to be done now. And so I guess my question, I'll get to it, is how is this time different? How can we leverage what's happening now? Like it's, the ocean is warmer everywhere right now. And us in Australia, uh, we're going into summer. They're predicting really, really devastating things for the Great Barrier Reef and not just the Great Barrier Reef, but the Great Southern Reef, which is the entire south coastline of Australia, which is, is massive and um, holds a lot of different marine ecosystems. They're predicting it to be 2.5 degrees above average, um, which is shocking. So how, uh, to the panel, how do you think we can leverage this coming heat wave and the current heat wave to motivate action? How can we make sure it's different to the times before? Um, no, thank you, Yolanda, for such a, such a good question. And I, re I hear you. You know, I was in out in Australia in 2021 um, and, you know, I was there during the devastating fires and I saw um, what's happening on the reef and it is shocking, absolutely shocking. But we need action. Um, it, it, enough talk. Um, it's everyone knows what's happening. How can we leverage this to, to create action? Such a good question. Um, Professor uh, Nerali Abram. What's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I think um, this is a it's a it's a really difficult one because I think it, it's it's a, a problem that is recognised, and we see lots of ways that we try and sort of harness this and we try and take action, but the the action that that is being taken are the, the solutions that actually aren't addressing the, the overarching problem. So we see let's <clears throat> deploy drones to kill crown of thorns starfish. Um, let's build an ark to preserve species um, so that um, we've got a chance of regenerating the, the reef at some point in the future. 
um, let's prevent runoff from the farming on land so that we, we don't put as much stress on the reef. And all of those things are, are important. All of those things are, are stresses and ways that um, we can take the problem and put solutions to it. But none of that is going to matter if we don't actually get the first bit right. And the first bit is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I think that um, we certainly need to encourage that innovation um, that sort of, I guess, falls under the, the repair part of um, what CCAG sort of calls for. Um, but repair without having the reducing emissions is not going to get us anywhere. It's going to make people think that they're doing something and then a huge disappointment when those efforts don't actually lead to saving saving the reef. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's my answer and, and I'll, I'll pass over to others yeah. for, for their comments as well. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Um, Professor Lorraine Whitmarsh, I mean, how do we, how do we prick our governments and, our, and, and the corporations into action? Because it feels like we're constantly having these conversations. We know the solutions are out there. We know the problem is there, but our actions are not matching the urgency of the situation. What's going on in the human psyche that's that's stopping this? What's creating this disconnect? Yeah, I, I think that you're right. So I think there are lots of things that that we can do. I mean, earlier Mark talked about just having a conversation with other people. Uh, Anybody can do that. Anybody can raise awareness of the issue and say that they're worried about it. At the moment, we know that actually the vast majority of people are worried about climate change, but everybody assumes that other people are not worried about it. This idea of pluralistic ignorance. We just don't know that other people are worried, but actually most people absolutely are and want more action taken on climate change. So the more that we can vocalize that, the more that will be evident to one another and to policymakers that there is a there is a mandate for, for change on climate change, for, for bold action. So we need to raise our voice. We need to be more active citizens and put pressure on our, our politicians to, to take more action. So write to our politicians. We can potentially protest. We can act as consumers, as Mark has also said. Um, we can act as investors. It, the people around us, we can, we can influence our children, our family members, people in our community. There are so many things that we can do as individuals not only to directly reduce our own carbon emissions, but also to try to change the system and try and get our policymakers to act. And we absolutely need more policy action. That's that's the really critical thing, because at the moment it is difficult for us to, to do the right thing. We all want to do the right thing, but um, other things are always kind of priorities on a day to day level. And there it, it's often inconvenient or more costly to uh, to do the low carbon thing. So we need governments to really step in, but they need to hear from people that this is a priority. So there's plenty that we can do, I think, to vocalise that concern. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, Professor Mark Maslin, you know, how, do we, how do we leverage these heat waves? How do we leverage these issues to, to enact change? I think it's we raise our voices. And I have to say, I was so encouraged by the change in Australian politics, whereby uh, a group of women said, I'm sorry, no, we, we, we've had enough, we're going to be elected. And they were. And I think that's incredibly important to show that through democracies, we can change things. I think one of the other thing is people forget how powerful the youth voice is. The actual Fridays for Future, young people going onto the streets and saying, I'm sorry, your legacy sucks. And if you don't actually deal with this, we're literally going to have to fix it ourselves. And we're going to look back at history and say, you failed us. And I think that's somewhere we need to actually demand we have politicians that we want to have. And I think that's something we have to work out. We need politicians that have a longer term uh, view. They actually have integrity. They actually think uh, for the people. And I think we should a vote for those sort of people, but we should also demand and actually keep an eye on those people so they do what they do. And for me, it's a no brainer. Australia, incredibly sunny country, incredibly windy. Wow, you've got all these resources. Why dig up all that dirty coal when you've got uh, resources literally sitting around waiting to be used? So, and guess what? It's cheaper. So, again, I think it's leveraging those things, it's taking economics 
Ade, I have to say, I slightly disagree with you. I'm really sorry. Companies are built to make profit. So therefore, mm -hmm. we regulate them, use them, make sure that they're very efficient at doing that, but they also do the things that we want them to do. At the same time, we get politicians to actually put in policies that drive the green economy and drive net zero as quickly as possible. How dare you disagree with me now? <laughs> <laughs> always sir always <laughs> no no thank you i i stand uh corrected but no i i i think it's absolutely fascinating conversation um but sadly we're coming towards the end of uh this month's stream but i'd like to give the final word to to sir david um on this what what are your thoughts on leveraging um our governments uh, on, on making change Okay, again, Addy, I'm going to answer a different question. <laughs> You're also unruly today. <laughs> yes, we are. So um, what I want to do, first of all, is agree with Nerily so that we don't lose her point, that if we continue emitting CO2 and, I have to say, a lot of methane as well now into the atmosphere and into the oceans, then we're cooked. We have to cut off our use of fossil fuels. We have to stop deforesting the world's forests. We have to do these things as the primary concern. But that isn't enough, is what the message was from our speakers today. We're also saying that there's already so much greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that we're heading towards a true disaster. And I do believe that we have to learn to remove billions of tons of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And we've got very little time to do this. This is a major priority. But at the same time, we, we have this business of buying time. And there have been some curious comments alongside uh, the, our faces while we're talking about buying time. I do believe we can buy time. But that means in particular that we need to see whether we can cool down the Arctic Circle region, which is heating up at 4.3 times the rate of the average for the whole planet. We will have to cool the Arctic Circle down and keep the ice that is formed when the sun has gone down to the South Pole, uh, when it's formed in the polar winter, uh, and keep that layer of ice there when the sun comes back. My best bet is marine clouds over the Arctic Sea during the three-month period. So I do think we need a coherent approach to this, and I think that Brad set us off well with a very coherent strategy for managing the crisis that we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Sir David, and um, thank you also to the rest of our CCAG scientists. Um, that's all we have time for today. I just want to leave you with um, uh, the, the three words that Brad started off with, which are reduce, you know, take the carbon out of the atmosphere, um, re remove, you know, um, and, and lower our carbon emissions and repair. You know, we have to stabilize the earth systems and, and cool it down. You know, so important. So thank you so much to our guests and thank you to our scientists. And we'll be back next month as uh, COP28 draws closer. But until then, goodbye for now.